good morning, depending upon where you are in this country. This is your old, humble, old Captain Bill Gustin from Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department. And we have a distinguished, uh, a group of distinguished guests, which I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, I want to begin by giving a shout out to my old Jewish uncle, Paulie Shapiro. Paulie, I hope you're watching. Paulie is not only a genius when it comes to hydraulics and water supply operation, but I'm going to just move out of the way for a minute. And if you can see the artwork that this guy makes uh, with, uh, I guess, with a torch, and it's it's amazing. But uh, uh, those were from Paulie, and uh, they were gifts, and they're amazing. So I uh, hope you're watching, Paulie, and uh, that uh, you're having a nice, cool summer there in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, then we'll start off. Uh, I want to remember remind everybody that we are being sponsored by Key. Hose keyfire.com is their web page, and uh, you know there's been a lot of talk lately, a lot of conversation about the pros and cons of uh, an extended lay with a trunk line, say a two and a half and three inch line, uh, wide off to a smaller, let's say two inch and three quarter lines. Uh, when you have a hose that has remarkable flow capabilities, such as key combat ready. Consider this, at 185 gallons a minute, your friction loss is only 25 PSI per 100 feet. So you could easily stretch 500 feet, that's 10 lengths of key combat ready hose, you'd have a friction loss of 125 gallons or 125 PSI. And then with a low pressure 50, 50 PSI nozzle, you're looking at 175 PSI. So there are some textbooks, uh, there are departments. Uh, the conventional thought was the limit that we could go with uh, inch and three quarter hoses is six lengths, 300 feet. But when you're looking at a hose like Key Combat Ready with that low friction loss, you could go way over 300 feet and still be fine. So um, let me just give you an idea of where we're headed in today's discussion. Uh, for years, most of us have been brought up in the fire service to cut metal, burglar bars, bolts, uh, dead bolts, padlocks, overhead doors with a aluminum oxide abrasive cutting disc. And they cut great, but they've got a couple of shortcomings. One is, as you cut, the diameter decreases, which means your depth of cut diminishes. Secondly, I don't know any firefighter that has any experience on this job that has not witnessed a catastrophic failure of these types of composite discs. And that is not in any way to demonize that industry. Uh, for the money, you can't do this kind of disc. And it's still being used by a lot of fire departments. To get away from some of those problems, most fire departments today are cutting metal with a diamond blade. But this is what the message we need to get out today. Don't think for a minute that you can't overcut a diamond blade and have it, it will come apart with catastrophic force with enough power to penetrate the blade guard on your saw and find flesh. So today's topic is going to be safe and effective operation of saws. So we'll begin with our introductions. Uh, Mike Dugan, if you go ahead, sir. Good morning. Good, morning. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Mike Dugan. Just uh, glad to be here. And hopefully we're going to have a good discussion about uh, saws, blades, and uh, my whole idea on this is it, a lot of it goes back to training and knowledge of tools and equipment. I think Sam's muted. Dan Shaw. Hey, Bill. Uh, the rest of the guys, always, always a pleasure to hang out. I'm Dan Shaw. I'm a battalion chief in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, also a co-author of 25 to Survive, and uh, I think I got tricked into uh, coming on to a, a hangout to talk about truck work, because this, uh, this is way out of my avenue, but uh, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, again, you know, we always go back and forth and, and throw barbs uh, between the engine and truck, but just like Mike said, is I think there's a lot that can be learned by engine guys about what truck work is doing, because we do have that 
uh, synchronized plan that has to happen on the fire ground. So we have to have that shared knowledge of what each is doing. And there's a lot of experience I think we can share across the board. So I'm sure it'll be another great conversation uh, for the Hangout. Okay, and uh, Clark? Good morning, everybody. Clark Lamping here, Captain, Engine and Truck 11 from the Clark County Fire Department, Las Vegas. Again, as always, I am honored to be here with this group of individuals talking about fire. Love it. And Sam. Uh, Sam's a newcomer to our group, and uh, he brings a lot to the table. So, Sam, if you go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. Yeah, I'm a lieutenant with the Wichita Fire Department, and I'm convinced that you brought me on here to make everyone else look smarter. Well, Sam, also, Sam, there seems to be somebody, uh, since you're a young guy, uh, I hate to be looking over your shoulder and, and second-guessing what you're doing, but in a sense, I am. Okay, yes. So, don't go. <laughs> I'm looking at a hashtag. A lot to the table, he can barely get his head above the table. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody, here, I want to show you another picture. And... And I don't want to, in any way, denigrate the. Uh, see if I get back, get back. The diamond blade industry. In fact, this is not a blade. This is not a blade. I have a stack of equipment right here. My my props. This is a blade. This is a blade. And you can tell it because it has carbide tips, and these are called gullets of blade chops. Of blade chops. This is a grinding disc or a grinding wheel. This is a grinding wheel or a grinding disc, and you'll notice. And I'll tell a little story about this later. This is a result of some firefighters that were a little bit impatient when cutting an American 2000 lock, which are not easy to cut, at least not in a timely fashion. And then this is an interesting, and I want to ask you guys about it because we call this a carbide chip, and I, appreciate, I apologize for its condition. It's been laying in my, my trunk and it leaks. Uh, these are chips of carbide, and uh, it's a multi-directional blade. Uh, one year at FDIC, we cut the hoods and trunks of 100 cars in two days, and the only thing we did in between the, the, the two days is change its rotation. Now, having said that, it is very important, and this is one of the problems where we, we come into problems with uh, with uh, diamond discs, grinding wheels, blades, if you will, is there is a definite rotation. And if you put it in the wrong rotation, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for premature damage. So uh, I'm going to begin with a, a discussion about fuel. Uh, ethanol is the nemesis of two cycle engines. If any of you fellas or you, of our viewers have boats with two cycle engines, uh, any kind of a lawn implement, you know that the ethanol is, is terrible for those engines, uh, especially in a place like Miami, Florida, because of the high humidity. What happens in the course of 30 days, the humidity is attracted by the alcohol in that fuel, which can be at least 10%. The alcohol absorbs the moisture. You know that when the moisture is absorbed, it forms a layer of water on the bottom of the fuel. This is called phase separation. And in as little as 30 days, your fuel can be no good for your saws. Many manufacturers recommend that if you are not using any kind of preservative, I'm not talking about the oil additive. I'm just talking about the preservative. So I would like to start the discussion with that. Have you experienced problems with the fuel with your two cycle saws and what are you doing about it? Mike? Well I've experienced it. Uh, the, the fire department in the city of New York runs all of their power tools at least weekly to avoid that. Plus the running on the rigs and everything else. But the, the ethanol is burning the motors out faster. At home, because I'm a tool nut, I have my all my tools. 
I buy the gallons of the uh, the ethanol free fuel at the local hardware store and I keep it in my ch two chainsaws in my snowblower because it does not affect the carburetors I keep it in my generator because you can store it over you can store it up to two years even though I I turn the gas the fuel off to my tools and everything else but it destroys the carburetors it destroys the engines so I don't use it at home uh, and I'm um, um, fire departments you know my chainsaw is a lot cheaper than a fire department chainsaw or a fire department rotary saw because I'm buying the civilian model of the tool and the damage we are doing by not spending the money on the fuel is ridiculous to what we're doing to our tools and I think uh, as somebody who respects my tools I definitely I have three gallons of it in my shed right now for my my tools we are uh, we're lucky here because we have such an aquatic uh, industry here that uh, there are fuel stations in the Miami area where you can buy what they call recreational fuel and it is free of ethanol for uh, you see people pulling up their boats all the time Sam do you have any thoughts on uh, the fuel mixtures yeah absolutely we um, just a couple weeks ago we got a reserve saw in um, once we shut it off, we were having to let it cool down. We are having a lot of problems with it, getting it restarted. We couldn't figure it out, and so we just said, hey, let's just go dump all the fuel out. Um, we'll dump out the gas can as well, and we made a new mix, and it's been running great since. And I can tell you this, our um, saw expert on the department said the number one reason saws come in as damaged or not working is bad fuel. Uh, yeah. With yeah. that said, you know the volley departments that aren't starting their saws every day or they don't get an opportunity to run that one gallon gas can out before that 30 days um, that true fuel or that uh, fuel in the can is very beneficial to them yes yes and it, and it is and, and our, our department is using something similar uh, I've got a good friend in the saw business and he recommends at least at, at the very least a 92 octane for the fuel and, and you can buy that kind of fuel both in and, and it doesn't have to be true fuel. There's other brands as well. You can buy it for four cycle engines or uh, with an oil mix uh, for the, the two cycle. Our buddy Dan Shaw, any thoughts on saws? I know you're an engine guy. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, one of the initiatives that uh, occurred shortly after uh, our fire chief came aboard a few years back was uh, he wanted to outfit our engine companies with chainsaws. Uh, and that was one of the concerns uh, from our, you know, the experiences learned from our truck guys and rescue company guys was, uh, one, that fuel mixture and the, the saws on the engines, yeah, they're getting run for their uh, inspection, but they're not really getting used that as much as the truck or rescue company. So uh, along the same lines, what we really carry now is that chainsaw with that small 32 fluid ounce can of moto mix or the, the pre-mixed uh, non-ethanol fuel for that reason because it's it's convenient it's right there and we don't have to worry about that it's like Mike said you got two years uh, even once the seals broken before that becomes uh, you know it goes bad so it is beneficial for us even on the engine company side but yeah I think you know, everyone is fortunate it's the beauty of the fire service we share our information so everyone kind of already was on the, uh, the up and up about how this stuff was just eating the insides out of our, our uh, saws I uh I'm, 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 inter I'm interested to hear what Clark has to say because there's no, no humidity in Las Vegas. So, do you have as much problem with ethanol laced fuel, or do you, do you use it? Um, no, we we don't use it, Cap. But for a different reason, um, I'm going to agree with Sam that we were having a lot of saw malfunctions, and just like his experience, it was due to bad fuel. And when I mean bad fuel, turns out a lot of the guys were not mixing the fuel correctly. So we went across the board with that product, that pre-mixed fuel, come delivered in cans. So we have the ethanol-free fuel in straight fuel, and then we also have the 50-to-1 mix in a can, and it eliminated a lot of our problems. And uh, the logistics guy said the cost of that fuel, the extra cost of that fuel is not a problem compared to what we were paying to fix all of our saws. And it was routinely saws were breaking down just because guys accidentally were mixing the fuel mixture wrong. 
So that's the experience we had. And you're right, Cap, with the hum we have zero humidity in Las Vegas. I think we have half a point today, and I'm miserable. Half a percentage humidity, and I'm absolutely miserable today. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, that, that premixed fuel really is working for our department. And one of the other things I saw that I found very, very interesting is a lot of our newer members coming up have not run tools at home, have not run saws at home, don't know it. One of the problems we had was the hearse tool runs on straight gas, but the kid is putting the 50 to 1 into the hearse tool. Or the saw runs on a mixture, depending on the saw types, it could be a 50 to 1, could be a 40 to 1, and they're m mixing the wrong fuels and the containers get switched around and all of a sudden what you think is straight gas is going in it having a marked container of this whatever it is this manufactured fuel for us the 92 octane with no ethanol eliminates a lot of the problems Mike you mentioned you said well we run our saws on a weekly basis is that correct we run our saws on a daily basis twice daily. a day daily basis. Twice a day. Twice a day. Okay. Uh, about the uh, the oil in the, in the, in the fuel, uh, I'm being relieved one morning and uh, passing on information from the off-going shift, and as the guy's walking out the door, oh, and by the way, we picked up, because uh, we have diesel pump at the firehouse with no gas. Oh, by the way, yeah, we filled up this, the, uh, the gas for the saw, uh, but I forgot to put any two-cycle oil in it. Oh, well, thanks a lot. He just about walked out the door without telling us. So, yeah, that, that eliminates a lot of problems. Uh, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here about the frequency of starting the saws. This is, and this, is a, this may end up being a failed experiment on my department, but what we were seeing is we're burning up a lot of fuel, uh, and we have only a limited supply of the premix that we're getting from supply. But more than that, we're wearing out the starting mechanism uh, because we're starting the saws uh, every day. We have 24-hour shifts. So I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try it like one every three days. Now, I want you to thoroughly check the saw, check make the arbor, make sure the blades are tight, make sure everything's tight, check the fuel, of course. Uh, but um, let's start it every three days. Here's another problem. And it has to do with young macho men. That compression release that is on your saws is for the benefit of the saw, not for you. I am well aware for you macho men out there that you strong enough to start the saw without the compression release. It is not for you macho man with Popeye arms. It is to protect the plastic components of the starting mechanism. The other problem is these guys that pull the, the, the starter cord out too far. So I think what we ought to talk about now a little bit is uh, how we train our new people uh, to run saws and, and what we train them to look for in a saw when they make that inspection. Uh, Mike, you want to go ahead and start, sir? Well, again, it depends on whether you're running chainsaws, whether you're running... Um, rotary saws, what type of different saws you have on the rigs. They have to be trained on every saw on the rig. There were different saws. We used to have um, three rotary saws on a rig and two chainsaws. And the chainsaws we didn't use for ventilation unless it was a weird uh, situation. But most times we used them for down trees and everything else. But again, you have people who've never started a chainsaw, don't know how to cut, don't know where to stand, don't know what the chain break is. It starts with basic training. It starts with working with them with what the saw is, how you're going to do it. It starts with your SOGs for your department. Are you going to allow people to use a saw off a portable ladder? Are you going to allow people to use a saw on a peaked roof? Are you going to allow people to use a saw from a towel out of basket off an aerial? And those are all up to your department to design for your people. Um, I have seen pictures of people in training holding a rotary saw over their heads on a portable ladder. In the FDNY, you would be, they would stop you and shut down that saw because if you slip, they're going to be calling you stumpy. Um, you know, it's just the way it is. 
So it depends on the tools. Um, we have slings on each of our saws where you can throw them over your head if you want to. I never recommended that because if you start to slip, you put it over just your shoulder and it slides off your shoulder, I'll get another saw. I won't get another you. Um, on the blades, are there things with it? On our forcible entry saw, we always had a pair of vice grips with a dog leash. And the dog leash was inside the screw. So we can pick a, grab a lock and pull away from it. So you're not cutting the halligan, the pike of the halligan. You can put that on to pull one of those uh, padlocks away from a gate or something else. So you got to check all the tools that belong with it. On some of our roof saws now, we carry a uh, utility knife where if it is a membrane rubberized roof, we're going to have an old piece of inch and three quarter hose with a couple of hose clamps where it holds a knife in there so you can get down on your hands and knees and cut the rubberized roofing off, peel that up before you destroy the saw because one leg of your cut, maybe two, your saw is out of service. So again, it's training and knowledge of these people. In the fire academy, they might have taught them how to start the saw. They've never really taught them how to use it with the real world they're going to find on roofs of buildings and how they're going to go up there and what they're going to decide what they're going to do. Sam, any thoughts? As far as the uh, startup goes, I yeah, think, I think the thing that drives me the craziest is guys, they want to come in and like you said, they, they just drop start it and then they run it hard for 20, 30 seconds and they put it up and you have to, um, you're going to have to let it warm up, then you go into it a little bit easy for 15, 30 seconds and let it cool back down. You, we've got to let that system um, decompress, if you will. If we put it away hot, we have a lot of unburned carbons in there, which is going to make it difficult to restart, and we're also expanding and contracting the chamber too quick when we do that. Um, on top of that, we look at the blade as part of the saw and we're listening to it and you know we're pretty good at looking for some wobble make sure that it's on tight got the right arbor and all that but we're not doing a very good job of inspecting our blades and I can have the greatest saw in the world but if I don't have the blade then it doesn't do anything for me. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you expand on that because uh, you and I networked on this yesterday Sam and uh, now that you're my new best buddy and uh, Sam would you comment on the technique of rotating a, uh, say, a diamond disc, the diamond blade, and tapping it with a screwdriver and listen to the sound and distinguishing between a good blade and a bad blade? Okay, yeah, I mean, and, and, and I'm not trying to bang on um, anybody that's heard that. I know that, you know, when I go to classes, um, I, I take what they give me and, and I try to apply that as best I can. Uh, we used to teach where you would hang the uh, saw on your finger and then just give it a tap and you would listen for a ring and that's how we're able to predict future um, ductile fractures or potential um, separation of the saw in the future the problem with that is if you look at the physics behind that it's the vibration and so depending on which direction you hit it um, how hard you hit it the angle at which you hit it you're gonna get a lot of different pitches and that's the video that I showed you yesterday was I can hit a bad segment and get the same sound out of a good segment. So what we really need to be doing is looking closely at the entire 360 degrees of that blade. And one of the uh, precursors to the fact that that diamond blade has suffered damage or is, uh, has been as far as thermally or has been torqued inappropriately is to look for those segments to be slightly bent at the gullets and also look for missing diamonds. If the diamonds are coming off, then the blade has been abused. And we've got to take it out of service. And that's not really popular when you're paying $250, $350 for a blade. Now, on the abrasives, you know, obvious, that's a little more obvious because you have chipping and, and fragments. I, I hear you, Sam. And, and uh, I think that the visual inspection, even the, you know, sounding the, the blade I don't know that our ears are tuned, most of us. I know mine aren't. And, uh, but um, there's no substitute 
for eyeballing that uh, that blade or that grinding wheel very very carefully and whether you're starting your saw every day or not you've got to make sure that the the, the, the blade is tight uh, there's a certain amount of torque I don't think anybody's using a torque wrench but I think that's just good common sense uh, remember the blades do expand and contract when they get hot uh, so we need to be looking at that and the other thing that just irks there's two things well there's a lot of things that irk me I'm just an angry guy there's a lot of things that irk me if I say this one is when I go to unscrew a gas cap on a saw and I see there are marks where somebody has taken a uh, uh, pliers to it and what happens is is they tighten it up and it, it's like an oil filter if any of but anybody here watching has ever really changed oil in their life um, you know if you tighten the oil filter too tight it leaks so what do you do you tighten it some more same thing with the gas cap we're tightening it too tight finger tight the other thing is uh, this drop starting is something I just that that is there's that is absolutely forbidden on my department and on my company. There's two things wrong with it. It's bad for the starting mechanism. And the other thing is you are holding a saw with that blade spinning at high RPM, just asking to have somebody walk into a spinning blade. One of the cardinal rules of rotary saw safety is you never pick that saw up. You never carry that saw with that blade spinning. When you start the saw and it's at half throttle, stall the blade out in whatever your surface you're in and carry it at idle. And if it doesn't idle properly, get the saw fixed. If you have to keep gunning the saw to keep it running, uh, it's, it's, it's no good. It needs to be fixed. Uh, Dan, any, any comments on how you're training your people? Any problems with starting? Yeah, no, Bill, you, I mean, you, you hit an uh, important part. I remember uh, when I first got a fire department, one of the key things was you always had to go back and you know, before websites and read some of the instructional manuals of uh, the tools you had. And so one particular manufacturer we carry of, of saws, I mean, it states very clearly in there that the, 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 the saw should not be run at full throttle unless it's under load. But, you know, if you've never come from any place where you've actually used a chainsaw, uh, like Mike was talking about, your only point of reference is what you saw in the Lumberjack games on ESPN or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So you hear someone fire a chainsaw up and they're holding it up in the air and letting it eat and then they turn it off. Um, so you're know, going back to explaining the why is pretty important. And one of the drills that I enjoyed when I was on a truck company and we, we put into uh, we, our class is, you know, hey, you give every guy who rides a truck this one pager that's the specs and the tool, the, uh, the maintenance, the use, and uh, some of the uh, the care for it. It's a one sheeter, so it forces every guy to go back for every tool that's on there, find all this information out where they'll see on a website that says by this manufacturer don't run under a full full load. So unless I have it underneath of a load, I shouldn't go to full throttle. And then you know they present that drill to the company. So now you're building that esprit de corps within the company, but also you're building that knowledge of hey, I didn't know that about this saw. I just I saw the other guy did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre thing, so I thought that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, and the key is, like what Mike was saying before, is it, it goes back to just understanding the why. Why are we even testing the saws or you know starting the saws in the morning? It's just to see if they start, the spark plug work? What, why, why do we do it? And you know, in a, in a profession like ours, it's laden with bravado. A lot of people are less likely to raise their hand and say, I have no idea why we're doing this because I've never used a chainsaw in my life other than what I did in the, the one week of recruit school where it was required we did it. Uh, to me, that's an opportunity to, to train someone and bring them up to the knowledge base you think they should be at and not an opportunity to go, well, you, you don't know as much as I do, so I'm going to discount you. And it, it always comes back to the way we drill and the way we train. Dan, any thoughts on starting training? I'm sorry, uh, Clark, Clark. So man, you must not be listening again. <laughs> <laughs> Senior moment. Up, Cap. No. Um, yeah, when our recruits come out of the recruit academy, they have very limited experience with saws. That we have so much material to cover in the recruit academy. <clears throat> you might get a couple days of work on rotary saws and on chainsaws, and we all know that that is absolutely not enough. We need to train to a level of mastery, especially if you're on a truck company. Now in Clark County, engines and trucks both have rotary saws and chainsaws on them. 
So it's important for the, the crews on the floor to train these guys when they come out. And it's a great refresher. Well, resources is always a problem. Um, I'm fortunate in my first in area, there's a lot of construction. I'm right on Las Vegas Boulevard, and there's always, always construction on Las Vegas Boulevard. There's always remodels going on. So as we're driving around our first in, I'm always looking for construction companies working. We pull right up to the job site. Hey, are you replacing any doors? <clears throat> Most of the time, they will give us their old steel doors, and we'll load them up in the hose bed. We'll take them back to the station, lean them against the wall, and that's what we use to cut. <coughs> Same thing with the uh, roll down, steel curtain and uh, and rolling steel doors. We have a we know a company in town that replaces all these doors. They have commercial dumpsters full of old garage doors that they're just getting taken out for scrap. We went and asked them. Absolutely, they told us you can have as many doors as you want. So we take rolls and rolls and rolls of these uh, commercial steel doors, take them to the training center and hang them up and practice cutting on that. But it is important that these crews on the floor realize that we need to finish the training for these probationary firefighters that are coming out of the academy. They are not anywhere near where, they're, where they need to be as far as mastery uh, for using these saws, the techniques, the, the tricks of the trade that we use, all those things that they need to be taught. You know, Clark, it's it's and it does come with experience. Uh, when you're cutting, we get doors, big heavy uh, metal core or uh, metal covered steel doors with they call them hats in the jargon of the door industry, but they are they're they're reinforcing ribs, they're vertical, and you you're going to keep your saw at a fairly high RPM at the govern speed, and as you're moving, the saw is going to speed up, and your cut's going to get a little bit easier. Well, you need to know why when you're cutting layered material, even if, even a car would, because you're cutting through some reinforcement. The same thing with an overhead door. Um, now, I got another question. I'm going to go through the, the group here. If you only had one rotary saw on your rig, whether you're on an engine or a truck, what blade do you keep on it? I'll begin. Now, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I'll wait for you guys to talk. Mike Dugan. Well, first off, I would like to say thank you to Keyhose for sponsoring us. That's keyfire.com. Keyfire Keyhose, we appreciate them sponsoring this, and we just wanted to get that covered. And I happen to have a Keyhose key ring. Well, so, you know, Mike, if I can... If I could get one of those key rings from Key Hose, I would heap all kinds of praise on Key Hose. Uh, but I'll seriously, send you one, Bill. It, it is, it's the hose that I use on my company. I've been using it for several years. I still think you can't beat it in terms of flow capability, as I discussed at the beginning of this uh, get-together, but also um, flexibility unbelievable kink resistance even at low pressures which is really a uh, a big consideration nowadays so don't go cheap on hose uh, you get what you pay for and you will not be disappointed with key hose and also when you contact keyfire.com and get some samples to try out don't use theoretical friction loss charts Arrive at your own friction loss by your own flow tests with a pitot gauge or a flow meter that is properly calibrated because you will be amazed at, uh, no, August 24th when the White House burned. I was on that one. But I was also at the, I was off on a Kelly day for the Chicago fire. So and the cow really took a lot of hits, I, I got to tell you. Uh, but I, I wasn't there that day. Well, but, uh, we do know, though, Bill. We do know, though, that wrong. Ben Franklin was your probie. That is correct. But I used to have to shovel up after the horses, so that was a... Uh, uh, and I got another great story for you. Old guy story. My dad gets on the Chicago Fire Department in 1948. World War II veteran. Great shape. Uh, he goes on Truck 3, which is downtown. The captain takes him out back. Son... I need you to chop through that railroad tie. Well, my dad's in great shape. And the, I don't know if you've ever seen the axes in Chicago, but the blades are about this big, and they keep them sharp. So my dad cuts through that thing like a lumberjack, and then the captain says, okay, switch hands and cut to the left side. What? Well, why? 
Well, when you're on a roof ladder, or they do a lot of chopping around a soil pipe that comes up the floor. Well, as you can imagine, it took quite a time for him to cut ambidextrously. And that's a skill that I certainly don't have. But I think it is important that our, our firefighters become proficient with an axe before they ever pick up a saw. Because the, I hate to use the old cliche, but the axe always starts. Now, let's get back to the question. What blade would you carry if you only had one saw? Understanding that you could change the blades. I would carry ahead, what we consider a forcible entry blade. Because of the district I was in with the roll down, burglar bars, uh, the gates, the locks, and everything else. Because gaining entry into the saw, the guy up on the roof can still vent because we're going to try to prevent any kind of a backdraft in commercial structures. I would, uh, I used to train my guys how to uh, go through the roof without a saw if we didn't have a saw. How to use the back of an axe to go through a wooden roof. How to figure out a different way to do it. How to chop a roof. But cutting the metal, it's very, very difficult to get through any kind of a fortified storefront without an abrasive disc to cut through some of that metal. Now, I used to teach them different ways that aren't in the books to cut the roll-down gates. And what I would have them do is above the locks on either side, if we had the roll-down gate, take a halligan, put a hole in one of the slats, turn to the other side, try to get it in the same slat, put a hole in the slat, then cut a straight line. Pull the slat out because the doors come out, pull the other slat out through the hole you put in there with the halligan, banging it out with the axe. Now the upper part of the gate goes right up. You could take the glass and the engine can have the, the whole ceiling of the building to start getting water in there while you're getting the rest of the gate down. It's only one cut. It's not the triangle cut. It's not overlapping where the metal's starting to get because that's where we end up having a lot of damage done to our saw because the metal uh, weaves back and forth because we've cut three quarters of that cut and that's where we can get that wobbling because the metal moves on us. So I used to like the center line cut and you'd put the, the point of the halogen, you'd put two holes on either side in the same slat if you could. And then you put the fork of the halogen in, use an axe, drive that out, drive it out, and then you can push the rest of the gate if it's above the locks up. Uh, Dan Shaw, are you? For, I think he's uh, one of your cadre. Uh, his last name is Troxel. I believe he's on a uh, Washington, D.C. fire department. Yeah, Danny Troxel. Aces. Yes. Uh, he wrote an article, I believe it was in, uh, we can say it now, Fire Rescue Magazine because it's part of the Penwell family. An excellent article on uh, forcing uh, overhead doors or uh, roll down gates, roll down security gates. Uh, it's very similar to what you were talking about, Captain Mike. And um, you need to make that. A, you should avail yourself to that. I don't know if you can Google it or what you can do, but the, the, the fellow's last name is Troxel. He's on DC, isn't he, uh, Dan? Yep, yep, DC. Okay, same question for uh, uh, Sam. If you only had one saw on the rig, understanding you can change the blades, but if you only had one saw, what blade would you keep on it? Diamond. I'd, okay. I'd run a diamond blade on a circular. Okay. That's All right. A, that's a no-brainer. I mean, if I need to, I can get into concrete. If I need to, I can burn through wood. Yeah, it's going to be slow, but we can get through it. And then for the forcible entry, it's going to go through the metal. Um, it, it just does, it does a lot for us. So, um, and again, it may not do some things well, but it can do it. Somebody's now, uh, asking, somebody's asking me about how many carrots in the diamond. Well, you know, a guy like me that's been married like so many times, what I do is I uh, I get I manage to get the engagement ring back from my uh, my ex wives, and then I get a guy to laser weld them on, and it makes a Great diamond blade. Great diamond blade. Dan Shaw. Dan hey, real Shaw. quick, Cam Gustin. They, I don't think they make a cubic zirconium saw blade. I'm sorry. Your, your, your thing's not going to work. Nobody can tell the difference until you start cutting, man. What are you talking about? Uh, Clark, 
I'm, I'm sorry. Dan, you only had one blade. What would you use? Hey, do you want uh, your clock to start wearing a bald cap or you want me to wear a wig? Because I don't know how you're confusing the two of us. <laughs> because you're so tan, rugged little dancing. <laughs> no, hey, look, I agree with anything Sammy Hiddle says because he's a genius. No, I'm with Sammy, and the key is, I think it goes back to, again, this is kind of that slippery slope of what we're talking about is uh, your saw should match the area which you serve, like any one of our tools. So, I mean, if I'm, in, you know, one of the things I, I always kind of despise when someone comes back from a conference, if the best thing you got out of it was, I heard this guy from New York or Chicago or Wichita or Miami said he used this where he works, we should start using it. Well, if you're in an all-residential area, we don't need the same thing as the guy who's in all world outdoors. So making sure that, yeah, I mean, take the uh, insight that you're coming from guys like you and, and Sammy and Mike and Clark, uh, but also incorporate that in your knowledge of your first do in the area you serve and make sure that tool matches what is the, the highest probability of what you're going to do and gives you the greatest versatility. But don't limit yourself to that knowledge base or that one singular tool. You know, expand your horizon so you understand what every one of those saw blades will offer and you're able to understand that why and apply when you see that situation. Clark. You only had one rotary saw on your rig, whether it's the engine or the truck. Which blade? I'm going to have to take a diamond blade cap. Um, you know, you, we could be on a Charlie side. Truck is going to go to the Charlie side. We could have to cut a whole bunch of doors open. And if we had a composite blade, I don't think that composite wheel is going to last as long as we need it to. Whereas the diamond blade, it's going to cut a little slower, but we're going to get a lot more cuts out of that wheel than we are a composite, a composite wheel. Fellas? We and I got, I got a question for Captain Dugan. Captain, we were taught using similar to that tactic you were talking about where you pull the slat out and the door rolls up. Okay, We were taught that, but we were also taught that you have to be careful if it's a real big door and you pull that slat, that door could roll up very, very quickly and it could hit the top. And we were told once you do that, move out of the threshold of the door because that door could roll up so violently and hit, it could knock the whole door off the brackets and drop the whole rolled up door down in front of you. Have you ever had any experience with that? Have you ever heard that before? You're muted, Cap. Cap. I have never heard of them. I've heard of them rolling up quickly. I have never seen one personally fall down. I have seen the video of the one falling down, but that was at a fire where the guys were working at where it was secured to the building, and they took the header down that it was secured to and dropped it down on the poor engine guys who were standing in front with the hose line waiting for them to kind of open up so they could hit the fire. So I have seen that happen once, but I have never seen it. Um, we used to also sometimes, when we put that hole in it, we would put the holes in the door, and then we would cut it. Sometimes the guys would put another hole in it and put a hook in there and kind of slow it up as it goes up. Okay, which is a smart thing. The only problem is sometimes if you got the hook up there, you got it jammed, so you lost the tool. But, you know, the trucks are right there behind you. You have enough to go over there. And the one other thing I would like to say, because I just found it very interesting in today's uh, Hangout, is Dan Shaw admitting to riding on a truck company. I mean, uh, just wanted to say thank you to admitting to us that you were a real fireman for a change. Oh, <laughs> We've got in South Florida, because of the hurricane force winds, we have the heaviest overhead doors in the country. Uh, the slats on our overhead doors, at least every other slat, I'm talking about an overhead rolling door with interlocking slats that roll up into a drum. Uh, they're some of the strongest, heaviest in the country. Uh, we have to be careful which slat we pull because uh, every other one, at least every other one, is uh, connected uh, physically uh, with a what we call a wind tab or a, a wind lock into the track itself so that the force of the wind cannot bow in the middle of the door and blow out the ends. I have seen those doors do that uh, several times. Uh, remember that these doors are, are uh, they're lifted and they're lowered with the assistance of powerful torsion springs that are up in that drum up ahead and when you cut a portion of the door away, you shift that balance. Those springs are to counterbalance the door. You shift the balance to spring tension over weight of the door. They will go up like a rocket, like an old window shade. 
whoop, 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 and then you come right back down just as fast and cut you up like a guillotine. So you're abs it's absolutely right. Now, fellas, I did not collaborate with any of you guys on what blade to, to use. Uh, but I've had this, this discussion with my guys on my company. I uh, come in in the morning, we got two saws. Uh, one of them's got a wood cutting blade, carbide tip. The other's got a, uh, uh, the diamond blade. Uh, and I promptly switch them back. Uh, they want to switch the blade in the morning, that's fine. This is the way I look at it. First and foremost, our uh, responsibility is rescue. That saw is a rescue tool first and foremost. I'm working in the burglar bar capital of the world. People are locked in because they're more worried about the bad guys getting in than them getting out if there's a fire. That saw is a necessity, and I want both of our saws with metal cutting blades. We'll have the time to change it if we go to the roof, but I want both saws with diamond metal cutting blades. Also, Murphy's Law, one of the saws doesn't start. We got the other saw right there to go. But in this day and age, even if you're living out in the sticks, man, I, I don't I don't see how you can operate without a without a saw in this day and age without with a metal without a metal cutting blade. We call that Bill fighting fire in a bird cage. Because it's only going to get worse. Brother. Yep. It's, it's only going to get worse. Yep. I got a, I got a couple other things. Um, how often, fellas, do you uh, do you check the tension of the belt? Now, I've been told to do it about every month, depending upon, I'm talking about a rotary saw now, a rotary saw. And uh, when you put a strain on that saw, you know, that belt does have a tendency to elongate, and periodically you do need to, to, uh, to tighten, that, uh, tighten that belt. So uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, also, uh, where do you, you're back, I'm going to ask this directly to Captain Mike. Where do you have your backup fire flighter uh, uh, stand in relation to the saw when the saw operator is cutting? Okay, two things. On the uh, belt tensioner, if you haven't used the saw out of fire or something uh, every month, after a good fire where it's done its work, whether it's a forcible entry blade, cutting gates or whether it's a roof blade cutting the roof after the fire the blade temperature tensioner should be checked okay you should make sure that the blade when you let go of the trigger that the on a rotary saw that the blade stops okay you should bury the blade on a roof if you're using it or whatever else and then be able to pick it up and the blade does not move okay if the blade is running on its own you're having a problem. You need to fix that tensioner. The person stands behind the guy with the saw. They are his eyes and ears behind him, backing up, because that's where we have a lot of our accidents, because you're down in your boxer stance, cutting, and the person is behind them. Whether if they have a uh, a self a rescue harness on, they can hold them by the rescue harness, and we use communications with slaps on the back. Um, you know, um, stop. One slap. Simple. The word stop. Okay. Two slaps. Start cut. Three slaps. Shut down saw. Okay. Period. However you want to do it. Okay. Um, that's fine. But you have to have some way of communicating with the brother or sister operating the saw that they know what you want them to do by, you know, two slaps. Okay. Start cutting. Let's go. Um, whatever you want to do, whatever your plan is in your department, but if truck one is using this, then truck two has to use the same signals. It can't be, well, we only communicate with our guys, because if you're at a multiple alarm or you're at the fire and somebody from another company is helping you back up, you've got to have the same uh, signals that they've got to be standard throughout the department. Mike, and I think it's important that the, the backup firefighter stands behind the saw firefighter, not behind the saw. Because if you throw a carbide tip, if you throw a tin cap, uh, if a segment, uh, or some nail or something should fly, that's where it's going, right in that direction. So we stand behind the firefighter. 
and uh, you brought up that the the, uh, the the signals. You know, we talk so much about the the, uh, the drawbacks of having tunnel vision, but Captain Mike, isn't there a time that you want somebody to have tunnel vision? And when I got a guy running a saw, I want him to have tunnel vision. Yeah. Like you say, you be you he needs somebody to be the eyes or the ears. I mean, you've seen guys that are totally oblivious to what's going on going on around them because they're so focused at the task. Right, and that, and I want that saw operator to be focused on the task, so he's not twisting the saw, so he's not straining it, he's not torquing it, he's letting the the saw do the work, he's letting the blades through the gullets cool, he's letting the saw do the work as it's supposed to do by concentrating on the saw. That's why we have given him another set of eyes and ears. Yeah, uh, Sam. We know that overheating is one of the leading causes of failure of, of a diamond blade, a diamond grinding wheel, technically, but we call them blades. Uh, what do you teach your people to prevent this from happening, the overheating, the loss of tension, and ultimately the loss of a, uh, a, a segment? Well, I'll tell you what. If we were uh, going to try to cut through a masonry wall to make another access for RIT or we're getting into some uh, heavy-duty overhead doors, um, use that can and, and try to cool it off a little bit. But other than the can or having a hose line, there's really not a lot we can do other than really watch how much torque we put on it. Um, when we start torquing that blade, we're making it work harder, and now that it's soft and the electrons are moving around inside that blade, we're increasing the chance of getting that gullet to bend, and that's where we're going to get that separation. Um, torque, torque is absolutely huge, and um, I'm going to pull up a picture here really quick that kind of plays on what um, Clark was saying. You know, one of the drills that we just did with our metal doors to make guys ambidextrous and work on their overlap and starting and stopping and torque was, um, I don't know if you guys can see that, but we had him put a star in the door. Mm, that is excellent. That is excellent. There's another picture, and so that does a lot for us as far as uh, building saw mechanics with our truck members. Yeah, and you know, you could go to the junkyard and pick up car hoods. Uh, like you say, Clark goes to a construction site, uh, gets all the uh, doors. Uh, they're great for uh, teaching those skills. Uh, remember that when you're looking at a, uh, a diamond blade, uh, when you see these, these here, uh, this is for cooling. And if you're running the saw hard and deep into a material, every few seconds you need to back off just a bit and let that saw cool itself. Um, if, the worst thing is if you start to see the saw get red hot and then shortly thereafter that saw starts to wobble, when that blade starts to wobble, you better stop cutting because you've either lost temper, you're getting ready to throw a segment, or your blade is loose. So, any other thoughts on uh, as far as technique, cutting technique, cutting safety, uh, Dan Shaw? Well, I mean, I'll just say it from the uh, since Mike just uh, knocked me down for riding a truck for a short bit. Uh, <laughs> did he hurt your feelings? He did. Well, between between that and you calling Sammy your new best friend, I think I'm gonna publicly weep. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, no, we can I, send you to a spa safe space if you want, Dan. No, I'm good. We're, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in the, the shadows. I'm good with that. Now, I, uh, from a chief's perspective, one of the things I've really learned that uh, is beneficial is uh, obviously, you know, it's always important to know your people and know their background. Who has a uh, construction background? Who's aces for that? But also, we're, we're just specifically for my department, uh, and I'll be the biggest cheerleader for Fairfax County uh, forever. But you know, in my battalion or my my department is a USAR team and they have the international status so they go all over the world so I mean I have a group of guys and uh, one of my companies my battalion is kind of the mothership of the technical rescue you know, these guys have cut concrete in Nepal um, so their their ability to manipulate and use a saw is, is pretty impressive and I can rely upon that but that house actually has no truck company uh, that's a rescue company and an engine company so it, it, a lot of times for a chief officer, it, it takes you the ability to kind of take off the blinders and not say, all right, well, only the truck can handle this. You know, I might have a guy who has a, a lot of knowledge in this in a completely different environment that can apply to what we're trying to do on this fire ground or, more importantly, going back to what Mike was saying, uh, how we drill and how we do our, our, our uh, 
company evolutions. You know, one of the things that you know is difficult for fire departments is, especially for the volunteer fire departments, they don't have a battalion per se. Uh, you know, my companies are all trained together, or you know, within their company, and you know, it's building an esprit de corps, and they want to be proficient in what they do. But we run fires with you know five, six, seven, eight companies, so we have to know how we all operate together. Even what you're saying about the commands between what truck one does and truck two does, we have to have that coordination between those efforts and. That nothing beats having those multi-company drills to bring all that together and see what is the skill set of every individual because that guy from Rescue 18 might be detailed over to Truck 10. And now you have that, that skill set there that you didn't have before. So it's always important, uh, especially from my perspective, where you know if I'm running a saw, something went really bad, um, even though I'd love to, but you know knowing what is the capabilities of all the people you have on that fire ground so you can have the most successful outcome is really, really important. Uh, I have to say this, and it has to do with your department. I've seen your guys work because I've been in Baguio in the Philippines in a collapsed hotel, and I have saw how you guys can cut concrete and wood, and that wood happened to be walnuts, and your guys' skill at running that saw was just superb, and we're talking like 12-hour operation. The other thing is, Chief Dan, is uh, I, one of the best drills I was ever at in my life was they collapsed a, a barracks at Fort Belver, at my Belver, Belver. and uh, you were still riding your tricycle at the time. This would have been in the early 90s. And we uh, had to cut the floor and then tunnel through and cut through concrete block walls and keep going and then come back up and it was just an absolutely fantastic drill. And to the man, I have to tell you, to the man, every hand on that uh, uh, Fairfax USAR team was a master at running power tools. So, and I was proud to work with them. I, mean, I appreciate I don't know that. No longer in that, but I got to tell you, you know, my my impression of Fairfax County Fire Department is nothing but good, man. Uh, you know. I appreciate the compliment, and uh, you know, and that's one of the things that I always try to stress is that it's very easy to live in a vacuum. Uh, when you have this all the time, we've always had a USAR team. You, you kind of take it for granted, um, and I'm glad that you know. Was Moses your instructor when you were down at Fort Belvoir? Uh, no, we had uh, the actually the incident commander. His last name was Tamalo, and he was quite a gentleman. I think his son uh, is still on the job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's fantastic, yeah. and I, I was in recruit school when you guys were doing that, so it was a uh, it's a fantastic training opportunity. Well, quite a gentleman, but I've always had we worked very closely with you guys, and it's always been a very positive experience. We're getting here, we're getting ready to the end here, Mr. Uh, Lamping. Any other thoughts? Starting technique, training, maintenance. You muted, Clark. Good. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, we've covered a lot. Yeah, just make sure that everyone's absolutely proficient with those saws. Expect these kids coming out of the academy to not be proficient with the saws. And make sure that we train them when they get to the floor. They are our responsibility. Okay. I just want to uh, touch on a couple other things that I wrote down. Remember the direction of the blades. Cool often by lifting the saw blade out of the cut. Don't allow it to get uh, red hot. Uh, if it wobbles, if it vibrates, shut the saw off. Listen and feel the saw. A happy saw is running at almost full RPM. Try to cut harder and faster than the saw wants to cut. You're inviting damage to the saw blade. That's how, and I do believe that's how. Most of our diamond blades are damaged, and aluminum oxide discs. If we're trying to cut too hard, too fast. I'm looking at about 159. This is the first discussion that we've actually covered everything. Everything. No, we don't have any time for any uh, uh, commercials for key holes. I'm just kidding, just kidding. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for key holes. And again, it's an easy endorsement for me because that's what I use on my company. And I'm very much looking forward to visiting their plant. We will have a live Google Hangout, uh, not, not next month, not September, but in October. 
Uh, it'll be my 100th birthday, uh, and I will be there at the key plant. And um, if uh, I might die of old age before that, but I understand that they're arranging to have me involved. So I will be there one way or the other. But I'm going to be there at the key plant in uh, L.A., that's Dothan, Alabama, Lower Alabama, next uh, next week. Hey, just want to show you something. I know we talked about it last last week. I've got the red and the black for our brother fire and sister firefighters, but I had to add this too. Again, God bless the cops. Say a prayer for them. They're going through a real rough time. It's terrible how unappreciated they are, and they are truly our brothers and sisters. So until next month. Stay hydrated, stay cool, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy. May God bless you and keep you safe in our most noble profession.